All right, check this out. Community goal this week is basically on cruise control. Uh, these are, I actually think they're just fine as far as community goal structuring goes. I wouldn't like it if a game tried to give you a kick-ass reward every week because you'd constantly be butting up against FOMO. And in my opinion, one of the things that makes Elite Dangerous the most enjoyable, at least for me, is that for all its flaws, it is a loyal game. It does not demand all that much from you in terms of time played each week. It's not like Destiny or Halo Infinite are starting to become, where to receive all the rewards that you need, you have to be constantly playing them. Elite Dangerous will occasionally throw you a really nice community goal with a really shiny bobble that you can chase, and a, re a reasonably straightforward way to get to it. Um, that being said, when you do have good rewards, it usually demands you to put in a couple of hours in order to get them. But I like that the narrative will occasionally take breaks and allow people to enjoy other things for a while. I wish that more games would embrace this model where you have, you know, surge weeks when you really need to get the numbers up, and then you take a break for a while, ease off, and let people have uh, a nice breath and maybe a, a smooth drink or something. I don't know. I guess, uh, I guess it depends on your particular tastes. So, this week, the reward is principally a reduction in the cost of all Imperial ships, including the GU-95 ship launch fighter and its fighter bay. So, and well, its fighter bay, all fighter bays. So anywhere in the galaxy you go, you're going to be able to get fighter bays at a discount of at least 10%, which is the minimum that was going to be delivered basically as soon as tier one was completed. But we've got tier two, so we've got at least 15% locked in. And According to an RS forecasting tool, we've got four days, 13 hours, and 40 minutes remaining at time of recording. And we're estimated to complete the community goal at 51% of, of the total goal reward in that amount of time. So you can expect this to get halfway done, which means we'll probably land tier three, maybe tier four. The reward pool, as far as contributions, is actually pretty, uh, pretty attainable. You need 1,580 tons to get into top 10. That's going to keep climbing. So if you're watching this a few days from now, you'll want to check an R for the latest figures. I don't anticipate this community goal will be very intense and by design. I think that this has been set up on purpose to give people a break. It's the start of December. There's a lot of stuff going on. It's finals week in the United States. So people are like wrapping up their semesters, getting the last little bits of things they need taken care of. Now, as far as participation rewards, the uh, contributors are going to get an Imperial Eagle at 75%, an Imperial Courier at 25%, and the top 10 contributors will get an Imperial Clipper. Um, usually the top 10 contributors category runs away from basically everybody by the end of the second day. If you haven't got a contribution, you're probably not going to make it. But for an Imperial Clipper, there's not a lot of enthusiasm. And there's a couple of reasons for that. As ships in Elite Dangerous go, the Imperial Clipper is not bad. I, I mean, it's a it's an excellent trader. Its two biggest signature strengths are, in the medium category, it boosts to a frankly ludicrous speed with engineering. If you take the thrusters and hit them with dirty grade 5 and drag drives, you'll get 642 meters per second out of it. And if you, you know, put some lightweight mods in here and there, you could probably get it up to 650. For perspective, most PvP ships are boosting to 550-ish. Some will get a little higher, some will get a little lower, but if you took an average of all of the PvP ships in the game that have been min-maxed and optimized, you're, you'll find 550 is pretty much the center point. So this will outrun most PvP ships that would try to ambush you in open play. There are some fringe small ship builds that can go faster than this, but as a general rule, once you get up into the 600s, the things that can chase you aren't going to have a lot of armor and might very well be in the category of vessel that you can fight. Thankfully, the Imperial Clipper's other signature perk is the same perk that a lot of Imperial ships have. The amount of shields you can stick on this thing are frankly ridiculous for its size. It has a similar benefit that the Imperial Courier has in that you can proc some really good shield numbers out of it with not a lot of effort. I mean, assuming you're setting up a trade ship, go enhance low power and low draw, you can get an absolute of 483, which isn't terrible. If you're trying to brawl in open play, you want to have around a thousand megajoules. So I would recommend, if you don't have prismatics, that you go with reinforced high capacity and then just stack a bunch of shield boosters in here and then engineer and proc those all the way up. But 
you can fit a size 7 optional internal in here. There aren't a lot of medium ships that can do that. I think the Python, yeah, the Python does not offer even a single size 7 module for all of its amazing perks. It just offers you a lot of size 6s. And what that means is that when we get the Universal Limpet controller, this ship will be able to run it. If you remember from the uh, FDEV broadcast where they were talking about what the Universal Limpet controller's layouts were going to be, the only Limpet controller that would be able to do one of everything in the game is going to be in the size 7 category. So that's, uh, that's not anything that you should just scoff at. The Imperial Clipper is about to gain a ton of utilitarian functionality. It's probably going to be... It'll be more versatile than the Python in that category in particular, which means we might start seeing the ship running support roles more often in PvE than we're seeing it right now, because as it stands, it's fast and it's heavily shielded, which means that makes it a really good trader for the medium ship category. It's not as good as the Python, ultimately, you know, trading is a capacities game, but if you're running high value cargo or you're running an open play and you want to outrun a ganker, this is a good platform to work with. Now, big downside and the reason why you don't see the ship used in combat a lot is the hard point spread. The uh, hard points are stuck out all the way on the ends of your nacelles, which means that they're about as far from center line as hard points get in Elite Dangerous. So if you use an Imperial Clipper and the fight's up close, you're probably going to have to use gimbals to get everything to line up. Um, you might be able to get the, the minimum aim assist that fixed weapons give you to make this work at a distance, but I don't see the Imperial Clipper used in combat very often because people get really frustrated with the hard point spread. And with the comparative lack of fire, uh, when you look at Python, the Python in particular, because the Python lands on the same size pad and has an additional large hard point, which puts it into a category of damage output that makes it a really significant threat, where the Clipper, well, the Clipper struggles a little bit just because it lacks that extra hard point. The Python gives you a size 7 power distributor, which is more than enough headroom for all of your hard points to be cranking out all at once. It's really easy to work with. It's the same... Actually, no, the Anaconda has a bigger one. It's a significantly sized power distributor and nothing that you should be shaking a stick at, for sure. It's yeah. It gives you so much headroom to keep your damage output going. The Clipper has a size 6 distributor. Uh, that doesn't mean that you're going to be running out of weapons capacity very often, but it does mean that you're not as free to run high draw weapons as you might be on something like the Anaconda. And your options are more limited. But it's still a competent vessel, and I don't scoff at anyone who wants to fly these. It's just a matter of knowing its roles and understanding where it's strongest. It's a good combat trader. It can be made into a reasonable explorer. I mean, if you take a look, I've uh, put a grade 5, the standard grade 5 jump range boost from engineering on the frameshift drive. It does use a 5A frameshift drive, which means that if you have a tech broker frameshift drive that you can stick this thing in here, I'm pretty sure you've got enough headroom to get 50 light years of jump range out of this. If you wanted it to be an explorer, it could probably serve you fairly well, and you've got enough optional internals that you can have a little bit of fun. It, your layout will probably change. Uh, you can put size 3A shields in here and still get them strong enough to uh, be acceptable for exploration. And its maneuverability as well as its speed mean that it's pretty good at exploring planet surfaces. It's not as good as the courier because it's a medium pad ship, so if you're in rough terrain, it's going to be harder to find a place to land. But it is capable and flexible, and it is a good stepping stone if you want to land in something that isn't too expensive before stepping up to a Python or into a large ship. Um, I haven't actually flown a Clipper, full disclosure. I've skipped it in favor of... See, when I went through the medium tier, I skipped straight up to the Python because at the time there were some credit exploits where you could run uh, Thargoid canisters into, uh, I think it was Obsidian Orbital, and uh, get paid like 20 or 30 million a run. It was ridiculous. I did that for a couple of days and basically skipped the medium ship grind altogether, jumped from a DBX all the way up into a Python, and then from there into an Anaconda. Now those credit exploits are gone, but that doesn't mean that you can't find other cheap, easy ways to make money. Uh, now for perspective, the Clipper base hull is 21 million. The Python is 55 million. So it's more than twice as expensive to get a Python as it is to get a courier, or sorry, as, a, as it is to get a Clipper. 
Um, the Imperial Cutter is 200 mil. So if you're in the market for one of those and we hit the 20% discount margin, which I think is reasonable, we might even hit 25, you're gonna see the price of this thing drop by 40 mil, which will put it down around 160 million. Um, for perspective there, the base wall on the Anaconda is 141 million. So if we hit the 20% category uh, and you're trying to get an Anaconda, you might consider just banking an extra 20 mil and going for a Clipper if you don't have one yet, because the, or sorry, going for the Cutter if you don't have one, because the Cutter is a real beast. It's not as fun to fly because it drifts like you would not believe, but its shields are ridiculous and it is basically the ultimate combat trader. The shields are so strong that you're basically gank proof unless you happen to fly right into a bunch of reverberating torpedoes. Um, you're basically assured survival in any combat encounter you might find in open play as long as you're angling for that high wake as soon as possible. You're very difficult to kill and it's a chore to fight a ship like the Cutter. So if you don't have one yet, it's a good thing to be uh, seeking for, although you do have to have the Duke Imperial rank in order to purchase this ship. And the reward structure is not going to get rid of the Imperial Navy rank requirements for ships that are not offered as rewards down here. So if you don't have any Imperial rank and you happen to hit top 10, you'll still get your Clipper or your Courier. Um, the Imperial Eagle does not require a rank grind. It's kind of a, a, a meh reward. It's the most boring out of all of them because the uh, Imperial Eagle only costs 72,000 credits. And since you don't have a, a rank grind requirement, you can just go and buy one anywhere it's on offer. You don't have to worry about it. The Imperial Eagle is not a bad ship either. Um, as far as the extra small ships go, it's it's got a, a reasonable amount of DPS. You're not going to be taking on anyone in a medium ship with the engineering meta the way that it is right now, but it's a really good tooling ship if you want to just practice flying something small. Uh, I think that's it. There's not all that much going on to this. Uh, I don't anticipate that this community goal will achieve completion, but I do think that we'll get uh, the contributors pool will continue to increase, which means that the amount of effort you need to acquire the individual uh, contribution thresholds is going to probably decrease as the week goes on. So if you uh, happen to want a clipper, uh, go for it. I don't know uh, if earning a ship for free means that the rebuy calculator sees it as zero hull cost. If somebody knows that or can... can uh, somebody knows whether or not that happens, uh, let me know in the comments. I've never actually earned a free ship in Elite Dangerous. Uh, by the time they started offering ships as rewards, I had already acquired all the ships that I needed, and uh, when I, I've got enough credits banked that I don't usually play these events, because unless I'm trying to buy something like a Cutter or an Anaconda, the amount of impact that it hits on my account is just not that significant. So I don't usually care all that much about these, but I know there are a lot of people who do. So uh, if you if you know whether or not the rebuy calculator regards your hull as being zero, which would actually have a pretty significant impact on your rebuy, um, just buying a cutter at a 40 million credit discount is going to reduce the amount of insurance you have to pay on it. And the cutter is nasty. A fully kitted cutter can have a rebuy at over 40 mil. So cutter owners might find a discount like this appealing if they want to go trade their hulls in. Uh, the Clipper rebuy, just as I have it fitted here, is 5 mil. So um, if the system logged your Imperial Clippers reward cost as zero, I'll take that off the list, then your rebuy would go from 5.5 to 4.5 mil. So it'd take an entire million off of your credit rebuy. I don't know if it does that or not. Someone would, would need to let me know in the comments below. Uh, and if you have any other input or any other observations, go ahead and let me know that as well. I'm still working on a couple more video projects. I'm hoping to have another one out middle of next week if everything goes well. Otherwise, uh, it'll probably come out the following Saturday. That's all I got for today, so I will catch you guys later.